Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Aarti Vidya Sagar from Elder Rights Advocacy. Welcome, welcome to our webinar titled, Oh, Well, We Can't Look After Them. It's brought to you in partnership by Living Positive Victoria, Thorn Harbour Health and Elder Rights Advocacy. Our organisations are all located on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We acknowledge and pay our respects to Wurundjeri elders, past and present, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present here today. This webinar is really very timely because for the first time since the beginning of the HIV epidemic in the early 80s, people aged 50 and up make up the largest group of people with HIV in Australia today. In Victoria, there are approximately 8,000 people in Victoria living with HIV and aging with HIV. And inevitably, this group will require some form of aged care services as they age, which is why I'm really, really happy to see you all here today. Uh, our hope with this webinar is that it will increase your confidence as aged care providers, as service providers, as community members, to take a leadership role in understanding the facts around providing services to people living with HIV, challenging stigma and discrimination, and making sure that older people living with HIV receive safe and appropriate aged care services. Um, I would also like to introduce you to the organizers, Jerry O'Brien from Thorn Harbor Health, um, Tanya Wasilewski and myself from Elder Rights Advocacy. Hello. And Vic Perry from Living Positive Victoria. Vic Hello. is going to moderate the discussion today. Thank you, Vic. And over to you. My name's Dr. Vic. You know, I'll call myself a doctor, but I'm not really a, a qualified doctor, but uh, let's just pretend for the sake of uh, this session and uh, this scenario, which I, I'm about to paint. I'm, I'm trying to get a picture going of a scenario of a person that, uh, an older person with HIV, that is where we're looking at uh, trying to access aged care services. So my client that I have in front of me is Jimmy. Uh, he's 75. And I'm starting to see some signs right. that Jimmy may not be able to look after himself at home anymore. And uh, even with home-based care and uh, probably needs to, to be in a residential facility. And uh, Jimmy has no children, only one older sibling. Unfortunately, uh, while they are close, but uh, the sibling can't look after him. Meanwhile, the rest of the family, including uh, some younger nephews and nieces, have pretty much disowned uh, Jimmy, and they don't want anything to do with him. And if you're wondering why, they not only found out about uh, Jimmy's sexuality, but also his HIV status, and this was quite a while ago. And apparently all this was just too much for them. So I need some assistance to get this aged care uh, uh, service for uh, for Jimmy. I inter anticipate it won't be without its challenges. However, I've got a group of dedicated and qualified individuals to help me out today. First up, we've got Dr. David Griffin, an HIV specialist physician at the Alfred Hospital. We've got Melissa Dahl, one of the clinical nurses, clinical nurse consultants at Bolton Clark. Kate Dalton, and Kate is an aged care advocate at Elder Rights Advocacy. Thank you. And, uh, and Kate uh, supports older people to have their aged care rights uh, upheld. Marcus Junger from the Community Support Program at Thorn Harbour Health. And Jeffrey Robertson, an older man with HIV who is currently accessing home-based care services. So welcome everyone, and thank you for helping us out today. Now, I'm on the phone with Jane. Jane is the manager of We'll Sort You Out Aged Care Services. I've described to her one of my patients, Jimmy, who needs to access a residential facility. 
Jane mm. tells me fairly bluntly, oh, Jimmy has HIV. Well, that might be a bit of an issue. It might not be that simple finding a place that will take on the job of looking after Jimmy. And with the residential facility, well, that out, there are other residents to consider. And I'm not even totally sure about some of the staff either. Aged care workers are a very dedicated bunch, but some can be a little bit overcautious. Now, Marcus, can an aged care service actually deny care to a person with HIV? Um, so I'm going to answer this by saying to start off that any aged care facility is under no obligation to accept anyone for care, regardless of whether they're HIV or not. Having said that, from our perspective at Thorn Harbour's Community Support Program, uh, we have found it's a lot better of a journey for the person if we work with that aged care facility, providing some on-premises training for their management, their staff, reassuring that, that education can be ongoing, not just for them, but for the workers that work there, and subsequently for the client as well whilst they're in there. This tends to have some better outcomes for the client and also for the aged care facility. Um, from our history, this has always been a good experience to do this. And as long as I've been in this job, which is, oh gosh, nearly 30 years, we've had lots and lots of clients in aged care. And it's it's been one of those really positive experiences where we've gone in there and worked with the aged care facility and we've had our clients well looked after. Just an anecdotal on the side, I went and saw two of our clients who are in aged care on Friday and I asked them a few questions, which I'll come back to in another section a bit later on. But um, this, this has been really productive for us and healthcare workers to do this to the point that a lot of aged care facilities now have the rainbow tick. So it's not just about someone who's HIV, but it's also someone who might be gay that needs to go into care and they're well looked after. So all in all, I think we need to work together as a community and we need not to let it be a challenge. Um, and look, it might be, as we've had some hiccups in the past, facility number one might not be appropriate, but maybe two and three are. And generally, with our experience, all our clients that we've had and that I've known in aged care are really, really happy where they are. So I just think we need to also understand that aged care is under a lot of pressure. So there's a lot of things that are going on in, in there for a multitude of reasons. We just need to go, I think, softly, softly and work with them and not, you know, not, not go at them like a bull at a gate. So, so I take it then uh, you know, sometimes it might take uh, a bit of research and, and going, uh, you know, for one from one place, but if that doesn't work out, you you know, eventually you'll mm. find a, a place. So, yeah. uh, uh, so eventually you get there. And it sounds like it, it's been positive experiences and only positive yeah. experiences uh, in the long run, which sound really good. Yeah. And, and you touched on something as well, uh, apart from HIV, and that's uh, another part of uh, Jimmy's identity is his sexuality. Uh, yeah. And so it's interesting when I was on the, you know, on the phone with uh, Jane, I've just got off the phone with it. Uh, she surprised me too with uh, uh, a bit of a, her being surprised uh, about Jimmy and his sexuality. And she so, showed a bit of reluctance there and, and said, and these are her words, uh, you know, she goes, well, many of our workers are from quite diverse cultural backgrounds and faiths, and I'm not sure how they would feel uh, about diverse sexuality. And if Jim, Jimmy went into a re residential facility, most of the parents at most of the residents are probably straight, so I don't know how they are going to get along uh, with Jimmy. And she even said, you know, what are they going to talk about? Which is interesting, I, I found. So Kate... We, we've just, you know, talked about HIV status uh, and regarding this other aspect of Jimmy's identity, can an aged care provider deny someone who identifies with HIV as well as diverse sexuality or even gender for that matter, for, for example, a trans person? Can, can a, a facility deny uh, care to, to people? 
Thanks, Vic. No, an aged care provider can't deny care for someone who identifies with HIV and or diverse sexuality or even gender. And the aged care providers that are with us today, of course, will be committed to that. Under the Aged Care Act, people accessing aged care in the community or in residential care have 14 rights contained in the Act. And in that under the Charter of Aged Care Rights, and the Charter doesn't reference health conditions, diversity, sexuality, capacity, or gender. And for example, in the Charter, if we look at uh, right number three, it actually states that everybody receiving um, aged care, as I said, in the community or in residential care, has a right to have their identity, culture, and diversity valued and supported. Mm. And then I'll jump to number one, everyone has a right to safe and high quality care. And right number two, everyone has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. And the interesting thing about the Charter, uh, which we would all, most of us will be aware of, is that um, aged care providers or services, sorry, I'm using the word provider, I mean, services provider, we all understand what I'm saying, um, have to sign that Charter. That's the law. And by signing it, they're actually a committing to uphold those rights. The person receiving that support doesn't have to sign it. It's not a, it's not a contract, but that charter will also be in uh, what we would call their service agreement if they're living, having services in the community or in their residential agreement if they were receiving care in a, registered, in a care home. So it's a really important document. And of course, um, I think we've touched on this a little bit, with that comes responsibilities as well for people who, for everybody. And I think that touches a little bit on what you were saying a moment ago, Vic, with the comment by the manager of the facility. You know, people living in residential aged care, as this is our example, um, you, you are looking at a, a very diverse group of people living in within that setting. And it, it is a challenge for aged care services to meet all of those needs, which Marcus has touched on. And, and I think um, I'm, I'm with Marcus 100%. There are some really good examples out there. Yeah. Sorry, I've, I've gone on a bit too much. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, not at all. No, it's, a, it's excellent what you've just said. Um, you've explained it very well. Uh, and particularly the point is about uh, not focusing on something like HIV or diverse sexuality. But uh, as you said, everyone has uh, uh, comes from a, a quite a large range of diverse identities. And we all know identities in its various aspects are quite fluid. So uh, managers need to be prepared for, for difference of, of any kind. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, so moving on, I, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, that I'm really quite determined to get some care uh, uh, for Jimmy despite uh, these initial kind of uh, challenges. And I certainly wasn't going to give, give in to any irrational fear that uh, simply was based on ignorance. And after a bit of argy-bargy on the phone, I, I did manage to secure the care that uh, Jimmy was entitled to get. And I found him a place in a, a residential facility, actually. Uh, so uh, this is about a week ago. Uh, however, just recently on the phone, I had Jimmy and he's sounding quite anxious and uh, and quite upset, actually. And he tells me that someone, uh, apparently one day, someone showed up in his room with a, a full gown, all doubled up with and doubled up with gloves, a mask. They were, you know, this uh, costume or uniform uh, that really puzzled Jimmy and, and quite upset him too. Uh, to to think that this person thought that they had to really gear up with, with everything to protect themselves. So I'm just wondering, Jeffrey, uh, while we've got you, how would you feel if if you're in that situation and someone walked into the room like that, all sort of protected uh, and worrying about your HIV? Someone going back quite a few years before I got Rosa, a lady who was... Um, working for the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence. Um, sorry, yeah, working for, for, for Spectrum. Um, she came in and um, came in and put gloves on, put the skirt on, put the, you know, the, the, the um, apron on, put the glasses on just to walk in the door because of her understanding of my illness. And she then, because 
it went sideways. She, I said, it's not acceptable the way she behaved. She went to her manager, told her manager, and the manager then contacted me, and then they took her to, she took them, sorry, to fair work because she wasn't happy with being, uh, she was really big, um, wasn't happy to be um, involved with my care, and they were putting her at risk by sending her to me. That was their, that was all because of my illness. And at the end of the day, that was her her um, perception and her husband's perception that they could contract something by just being in the same place and sharing, you know, um, things like wipers and cloths and sheets and all that sort of thing. Mm. Terrible thing to happen. And then not so, not so long ago, in um, my particular situation, I had a, 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 um, a duty of, I had a case manager for 20 years. Amazing, amazing, from the Brotherhood of Lawrence, one of the best in the world, and was replaced by a couple of women. And then I got this other one who started, and she was came in, and as soon as she came in, she started telling me what to do, telling me how the package was going to be run, telling me how I um, was losing too much money in my package and I needed to change my care, change my hours and I only had someone coming for six hours. And then I got out of hospital, which is a big issue, and I came home and she had neglected me for three weeks about changing the, getting the nurses to come out to change my wound and I developed a very serious septic problem on my butt because of her neglect and failure of duty of care and that's going through the motions as a complaint now but normally I've been happy with the way I've been treated with my home care this is one or two but this this one with the manager with the case case manager it's just appalling it's neglect mm -hmm. bullying and lack of duty of care and that went on for four months until I put it all in the line I had four months of or what, maybe six months of that going on, four months of it going on. So I got out, I got it in April, and then that was uh, in the middle of May when I got it sorted. And then I've now taken from May until now to come good. And I'm still getting nurses twice a week to, re to rest my butt. And that would not have been at that stage had they sorted it earlier. And this, mm -hmm. this woman was in control of it, she made mistakes, and She'll she'll answer to it because I made a few complaints. So Jeffrey, you, you know, I, I guess you, what you've just demonstrated is you, that you know, thankfully you were assertive and and felt that you know what uh, what you were entitled to in terms of your care. But we've also heard uh, you know the negative consequences of uh, of people not doing the right thing and not providing uh, the care that they should yeah. be. Um, uh, so. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking, so Melissa, do, um, do you think uh, with this example uh, uh, do, do, and the example that I uh, mentioned before about uh, the worker coming into a room and all overprotected, uh, worrying about getting HIV from, uh, from, from Jimmy in the example, uh, do you think that that person was overdoing it? What, what, uh, and I guess what is it about HIV and, and how is HIV transmitted? I, is it that simple uh, or is it difficult? Yeah, so unfortunately they are overdoing it and I think we find in aged care there are people from many different cultures who view HIV very differently than we do in Australia today. Um, yep. I'd remind the aged care workers that we have universal precautions for a reason um, because we treat everyone as potentially infectious because we don't know what anyone might carry. Mm -hmm. um, every aged care provider also would have an infection control nurse um, who can re be referred to um, and can organise training as as required. Um, I guess in Jimmy's case, because it's in home, uh, it's uh, a residential aged care facility, I would recommend the Alfred Statewide HIV program, um, which, which can provide education um, to aged care facilities, community health centres and health services. Um, whereas more in Jeffrey's case, because it's a community-based organisation, um, I would recommend you know, Bolton Clark's HIV provide education. 
Um, there's also other great resources out there for providers and for anyone wanting to learn more about HIV and ageing and aged care. Uh, one of those is the um, ASHAM online module, which is HIV and ageing for aged care and community nurses. Um, Bolton Clark, in consultation with Living Positive Victoria and Senior Voices, also published a book um, going on 10 years ago now called Positive Caring, which was a handbook for people caring for older people living with HIV and a guide for people living with HIV. Another great program is the Positive Living Centre, um, have a HIV one-on-one -on -one training and interactive 90-minute session, uh, which can be conducted face-to-face -face or via Zoom. And there's so many other great resources out there, Vic, um, mm. like Thorn Harbour, Living Positive, Department of Health and the Alfred, who all have um, online web-based educational resources that um, aged care providers, carers and anyone really can refer to. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's amazing. I mean, the, the, uh, for a person who can say that I don't know or have the knowledge uh, of what to do, that's one thing, uh, but no one can say that that that, that, that it isn't out there. That there aren't the resources uh, to be able to fix that because it sounds like there are plenty of places to go to 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 get the knowledge and the skills to to be able to do a, a proper job. And what we'll do is we'll uh, uh, give that uh, uh, list. Uh, and uh, uh, put that in the chat or at least email it to all the registrants uh, yep. after this uh, session because it sounds like an amazing list. And, and Marcus, what about, uh, say, a component around uh, sexuality, gender diversity, that kind of thing? Can that fit uh, alongside uh, HIV in, in, in training, in this kind of training? Uh, yeah, I think it does. Um, but we also need to bear in mind that it needs to be on a case by case basis. And I think you need to have a good understanding of your client and where they're coming from, where they've been, what their life's experience is, and then approach the facility and discuss these issues with them. Um, you know, I think that um, a, a lot of this stuff, you know, we, we feel like we'd like everything out there for everyone to understand and stuff. But I think in some cases, some things are just not appropriate. So I think mm. our first port of call must be the client. Like, what do you want, mate? You know, what can we do to support you in there? And as Melissa said, there are so many resources now, more than ever was when I came into this job 30 years ago. This sort of stuff was done very ad hoc by the CNC nurses in the hospitals or some of the specialised Bolton Clark nurses and myself as well went out to a couple of places and provided training around HIV and stuff like that. And we talked about some people who are, you know, just different and what that difference means to people and how people are acknowledged for that. And, you know, and, and my experience, as I've said, um, has been really positive. You know, there's not been anyone that's been denied stuff. As I mentioned before, I um, saw two clients last Friday um, that are in a nursing home and they have a great life there. I asked them, what's the word you would describe where you're living? And both of them said family. And that's, to me, that says a lot because the people that work there look after them. And I've been in their rooms when workers have come in and there's this little banter going on between them. And, you know, and I talked about, I specifically thought of this session today and thought oh i wonder what sort of questions would come up and i asked you know would is your sexuality important and they and they said it is but it's only to me um i'm we're all at ages now that you know we don't really have a sexual life but what we do find is what we need is to be well cared for make sure we get our meals on time make sure we get to our appointments make sure you know if anything crops up a doctor comes in and sees them and they have the little banter and all sorts of social stuff that are happening in those facilities. And those facilities are really open to us as workers who support these clients going in there and, you know, have a chat with them and give them support as well. So I think, yeah, yeah all, all training is good, but I think it starts case by case with your client and us having a conversation with them. And which uh, that kind of alludes to really the, the whole point, and which is a big thing at the moment, or has been for a while now, I guess it's a set, uh, client centered care. 
Uh, yeah. So that that's something if uh, if people don't really know much about it, uh, look it up because it's uh, it's really important to, uh, to recognise difference uh, in everyone, and so it is about the client. Um, uh, so moving on to uh, something else that, that came up recently for me as well, because uh, uh, I overheard someone or someone told me that they overheard an interesting conversation between two staff at uh, at this facility. And apparently uh, one of the people was saying uh, to the other person, they said, oh, hey, do you know that person in room 96? They have HIV. Oh, really? I don't have any experience with people with HIV, I must admit, but I'm, I'm concerned about catching it. Although I did see something on the on their in their file, uh, uh, a medical term that was undetectable, and I even saw that on a bus stop uh, recently on the way to work. I saw the big letters U equals U, and the words undetectable equals untransmittable. Is this the same thing? Not sure. So David, U equals U. Uh, now it sounds like some new dating app. Uh, but what does U equals U actually mean uh, in, in the real world, in reality? And how did it come about? What, what was the science behind it? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thanks, Vic. Um, that's a really uh, good question. Uh, and there's probably a couple of parts to that question, as you alluded to. There's obviously the history of the U equals U slogan, um, and, but also the, the evidence and science behind it. But before I sort of go down that um Tangent. I just wanted to pick up on the comments from Jeffrey. I'm really sorry, Jeffrey, for the experience that you had um, and the impact that stigma had on your care. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, people with HIV, even in 2024, still experience um, disproportionate stigma um, in healthcare. Uh, and it even without, so much, sorry, sorry, it wasn't so much. It wasn't so much against my sexuality or anything like that. It was just more against. Or the fact that they just injected me as a client, mm. and the reason we that. don't know, and we we don't know that until they do the investigation. I've investigation. already done the of aged care uh, complaints. I've already done that through the mm. Brotherhood, and I've sorted it out. But at the end of the day, it was really unacceptable, and I mm. I have had, um, you know, uh, recognition from other people that come out to me and see me that her behaviour was unacceptable just as a human being. Nothing to do with HIV. Right. Just, just, so I'm sorry for your just, experience. That's um, all right. In any case. Um, sorry. And, and I guess even before we think about U equals U, I think it's really important to acknowledge that occupational transmission of HIV is exceedingly rare, yeah. um, even prior to antiretroviral therapy. Um, and it's really important to remember that HIV itself is not passed on through physical contact, mm. um, you know, or some of the other behaviours of concern that people might be worried about um, in in aged care. Um, yeah. But the U equals U slogan um, itself has really become popular um, over the last almost uh, decade. Um, it, you know, it's obviously a very simple message. It's highly accurate, um, and it has the power to end or at least um, help to address HIV stigma. Um, but it all sort of started around 2008 when the Swiss statement, um, which sort of suggested that people who had undetectable viral loads were no longer contagious, um, as, it, as it were. Um, and that was really based on the, the fact that, you know, there was good evidence that the risk of transmission, at least by through through sexual intercourse, um, was related to the level of virus that can be detected um, in blood. And if we looked at a community level, new diagnoses went down as more people had access. But, um, you know, at a community level, new diagnoses went down as more people had access to um, treatment. But the really game-changing data came out of a number of studies um, in and around sort of 20, 2010 to twenty. Uh, 15, which really showed um, that, um, you know, there was abundance of uh, evidence uh, across 
sort of heterosexual um, uh, and homosexual uh, transmission of HIV through sex, um, that where the person living with HIV uh, was on treatment with an undetectable viral load in blood, um, that um, you know HIV could no longer be transmitted uh, through or none of the partners essentially in these studies um, developed HIV. Um, uh, and Australia followed it up with its own um, opposites attract um, study. Um, and so really, I guess it's now widely accepted um, with really robust evidence that virological suppression or an undetectable viral load um, uh, in blood for a person living with HIV eliminates the risk of sexual transmission um, of HIV. Um, so that's sort of the um, the nuts and bolts of the U equals U message, but very widely um, accepted um, and really just should be held in the context of the fact that you know, it, it relates predominantly to sex, but occupational transmission of HIV is exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Mm. That's, uh, uh, and that seems quite amazing that, uh, that we're in this situation where we know that uh, people being on effective treatments basically just cannot pass it on. That That's uh, probably something that a lot of people still don't know. Uh, yeah, that's and, a big uh, issue. Yeah, and um, so we, we know that, that, that the case is that, that, uh, uh, that, it, that uh, treatments basically render the virus uh, uh, untransmittable. So it's, it's, it's fantastic news for, for all people with HIV, for sure. Um, and talking about medications uh, and effectiveness, et cetera, uh, you know, medications can be quite complex, uh, uh, HIV antivirals. Uh, uh, and so I guess when they're being introduced into a new regimen uh, of medications for people, uh, it can be quite confusing perhaps. And um, and I guess part of the confusion could be in terms of what they uh, might interact if someone is already on, for example, uh, uh, treatments for their cholesterol or diabetes, blood pressure, a whole range of comorbidities where antivirals are introduced and all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, what kind of interactions could could, could there be uh, between HIV antivirals and, and those sorts of medications? So, David, what is the the, the issue there? Is it, is it that complex and, and difficult to manage or is it quite clear that uh, anti antivirals go fine with uh, uh, other medications? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a reasonable concern. Certainly over time, that has become a lot easier. A lot of the newer antiretrovirals um, don't interact the way some of the older ones did with as many, medica as, as many medications. Um, and so we'd really need to be, we, if we were wanting to start something new, we generally need to carefully review Jimmy's medication list just to be sure. Um, and so, you know, providers just need to be aware that that um, the you know introduction of new medications, you know, should just be cross-checked um, with the antiviral medications that the person with HIV um, is is taking. Um, and, and there are some resources um, available, um, you know, freely on the internet. Um, there's a Liverpool University um, HIV drug interaction checker. Um, they've actually got a drug interaction checker for hepatitis C and COVID treatment as well. Um, but, you know, it allows you to essentially plug in um, the antiretrovirals with the new medication that you might be worried about. Um, and um, it, it comes up with a sort of a traffic light green amber or red um, and where it's red or amber you know some alternatives that might be be similar so it's not really something that needs to be um, you know worried about too much but it, it's just important to be vigilant that you know when we start new things we just have to be mindful of the the, the medications that the person already takes and that really applies to every patient not just um, you know people with HIV um, you know, often we, we we find ourselves treating side effects of medications with more medications. Um, so so it's always worth just you know checking a person's drug list, uh, making sure there's nothing that shouldn't be there, um, and obviously that there we're not sort of there aren't any expected um, interactions. Mm -hmm. 
had that sound advice for sure. Um, uh, and it's interesting because you know, it can be quite, quite complex, I guess, when a person's on uh, uh, a whole bunch of medications for comorbidities plus their antivirals. And and I know that yeah after thank you. And I know that um, uh, Jimmy uh, uh, can be uh, quite confused with uh, uh, the medications he's taking, as he's told me. And I'm just wondering. Uh, you know that's for for Jimmy, and then uh, what about uh, the the uh, the workers as well? Um, but in terms of, uh, I guess, health literacy, uh, particularly for Jimmy, um, you know, it, it, it's something that, it's a bit of an issue and something that needs to be addressed. And I know he's got some brochures and leaflets here and there, and we have uh, the odd conversation uh, as well. But I'm just wondering, Melissa, uh, you know, is it is it worth really worth encouraging someone like Jimmy to be health literate, to to be on top of uh, what he's taking and why he's taking it, and and the side effects uh, in terms of impact? Yeah, you know, does it make a difference if a uh, the more health literate a person is? I think it does. I think it's really empowering for the individual, um, but it needs to be driven by Jimmy and what Jimmy wants. And I think it's important to find out. Um, how Jimmy learns. You know, I think we often give people pamphlets and just expect them to read it, but is it worded in the correct terminology for that people to understand, that person to understand? Um, you know, some people prefer to watch a video or speak to other people to get information. Um, and we need to encourage Jimmy to ask as many questions as he wants. You know, ask his GP, ask his specialist, you know, ask his family, pharmacy, sorry, and his nurse. You you know, things like can you have them with food and does he need to be do they need to be taken at a specific time you know is there a, is there a reason why it's in a different box than it was last time you know it's not the first time um unfortunately pharmacists have given the wrong medication to people um it might help jimmy to write things down in the way that he will understand them and the pharmacy can also prepare a sheet for Jimmy with each tablet and what it looks like and what it's for with the instructions on how to take it. Of course, there's always um, the Webster packs that the pharmacies can prepare or, or sachet systems, doset boxes and other things to encourage Jimmy's independence. He doesn't need to do it on his own. Uh, and if he wants to, that's great. But there are other um, means to help him. You know, there, there's many alarms out there as well to help him, remind him to take his medication. Um, yeah. yeah, so that, that sounds like, uh, uh, again, the, the amount of support and resources uh, for something like this, uh, it's out there. So, uh, uh, but importantly, as you said, it's a, it's up to Jimmy. I guess he's got to drive it, and he's going to make sure uh, the he uh, I guess expresses what he wants uh, and what he yeah. needs, rather than uh, other people or workers or those around him making assumptions of, of that. Um, yeah, but I always think it's it's best to encourage the person to be as independent uh, as possible um, and encourage their self-management. You know, I know Living Positive has a great self-management program um, that encourages in independence and skill building as people age with HIV. Um, you know, and maybe Jimmy could benefit from a home visiting nurse such as Bolton Clark. Um, and, you know, we, it doesn't have to be a forever solution, but they can go in, we can go in, we can assess him, we can provide one-on-one -on -one education and review things and feedback to his doctors. You know, maybe it's too complex. Maybe we can, instead of making it three or four times a day tablets, make it twice a day so it's easier for him to manage. And uh, fortunately, as we are seeing uh, at the moment, the modalities or the way uh, treatments are being delivered these days, particularly now with long-acting injectables, and so the the science, uh, basic science, uh, and making treatments is is becoming a, uh, I guess a lot more advanced and making it easier for people to to take their treatments, which is good to see. Just moving on, uh, just mindful of the time, moving on to uh, another issue and I guess getting back to uh, Jimmy's sexuality and, and talking about how people, uh, I guess, are allowed to express their sexuality uh, in a residential facility. 
Um, you know, the people, uh, you know, Jimmy might have some visitors or he might have a special friend that he might want to have over and uh, they might want to be kissing in the room or, or even Jimmy might want uh, his special friend to stay over one night, that kind of thing. So um, I'm just wondering, uh, Kate, uh you know what? What? What are the? Are there rules, regulations? What? 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 What's in place for that kind of thing? Are people allowed to do whatever they like? Thanks, Vic. It's an interesting word, isn't it? Allowed, and I, I understand that entirely. <laughs> um, I get it. I really do get it, and I'm sure all of us in the room get that. Because, but again, I, I will go back to the charter. Um, um, which is really um, such an important piece of legislation for people who are accessing aged care. And um, Jeffrey, you would know about this with uh, the, the complaints that you have made, and you would um, probably be familiar with with the charter. And if you look at um, right seven and eight on the charter, it actually says that people have the right to have control over and make decisions about personal aspects of their lives and their personal and social life. And if you Recall what I said earlier on, the Charter does does not reference any particular cohort of people. So um, one of the things we talked about was, um, you said that we talked earlier about it, a kissing, for example. We talked about that. And, you know, in that context, if um, a person contacted my organisation, Elder Rights Advocacy, and wanted some advocacy support around perhaps being, uh, have the sense or even being openly informed that they're not allowed to behave in that way it, where, when the residential facility. And if they chose representation with an advocate, then if it was me, for example, or any of my colleagues, we would be looking to that charter and particularly going with uh, seven and eight on that charter. And also number 11, to be listened to and understood, uh, independence, all of those things. Um, I've been around in aged care a little, quite a while too, like Marcus has. I. I have a 30 year tenure too, and I've seen lots of changes in residential care settings. And I'm, I'm probably gonna jump to something else, which is, I think we touched on, uh, what if Jimmy would like to have someone stay the night, for example. Um, and in that context, um, it's been my anecdotal experience in the past, and I, I remember my longevity in this um, setting that historically um, there has been a little bit of resistance from providers for any resident who wishes to have a partner or carer um, stay the night. And I think there's a, as time has gone by, I, I do think that more and more residents have been supported with that uh, decision that they've made, that they want to have that person stay over. And there are obligations, of course, that that provider has, not only to uh, Jimmy, but to Jimmy's fellow residents in that, um, the, the provider is in fact the primary caregiver, not only to Jimmy, but to fellow residents in the facility. So there's occupational health and safety that comes into play. You know, will residents, uh, fellow residents be, feel safe with us, if you like, stranger? Overnight, will staff be safe? And they are realities that, that um, providers do have to face. But going back to um, what Marcus was saying earlier, I really think that... Um, providers are working really hard towards meeting individual care needs. I see that more and more and more as time goes by. And, you know, for me generally, big respect for, for the changes that are there. And any time that um, I find myself being asked to um, say, for example, support Jimmy, if Jimmy asked me to support him with any of these issues that we've talked about today, again, just my anecdotal experience. But what I find is that um, we're often in the room having that meeting because we're there because uh, miscommunication, misunderstanding leading to assumption has occurred. And um, one way to start that meeting off, of course, would be we're all committed to getting resolving the matter. And I think uh, Melissa was talking about that earlier with health literacy. It's about um, knowledge is power. And I think that I think I really am going off on a tangent now, but I do think that facilities are working towards um, much more upskilling of staff. Yeah, um, and, and thanks, I guess that's all right. Um, I guess 
uh, and you're talking about the importance of uh, of sticking to yeah you know, you've got a charter you've you've got uh, I guess settings in place or a framework to be able to to work to so it shouldn't be about a person's diverse sexuality or gender that shouldn't have anything to do with uh, whether uh, the provider uh, and I don't want to say allows but uh, uh, you know where it's okay uh, for Jimmy to have. Uh, whoever that person may be, uh, uh, even stay overnight if they want to. It's more about uh, the safety of the place and that kind of thing, which, uh, uh, which is good to say. And it sounds like uh, people are getting better at it. Um, so I, I'm just uh, thinking of uh, uh, not trying to paint this as being complex or anything, uh, what we've been talking about, but uh, I guess I want to get a sense uh, how complex it might be. So, David... Uh, and your experience as a physician looking into your crystal ball that you've got sitting on your desk in your office that you're looking to now and again, can a person with HIV in their 50s, for example, look forward to a relatively healthy ageing life? Uh, so I guess you know, I'm talking about the differences in impact uh, that comorbidities, complex me medications, that kind of thing, would they be that different in terms of impact to a person without HIV? Uh, you know, where are we where, where are we today in terms of uh, difference? Is a, an aged care worker going to have a harder time, or a nurse, a harder time looking after a person with HIV ageing than a person uh, who was ageing without HIV? The short answer, Vic, is no. Um, obviously, we know that life expectancy of people with HIV is improving with antiretroviral therapy. Um, in some models, interestingly, it, it looks like it might even exceed that of the general population. Um, but what we do know is that as people with HIV age, they do experience more frequent and probably an earlier onset of a number of um, classically age-associated comorbidities, things like blood pressure, um, you know, cholesterol, um, those sorts of things. But equally, people with HIV uh, are already engaged in care, and so they have those things picked up earlier um, and often treated uh, earlier or addressed earlier um, as well. There are some unique things that are um, associated um, with with HIV, of course, but many of these can be um, picked up early or, or even prevented um, with antiretroviral therapy, uh, vaccines, all of those sorts of things um, and sort of early detection, that sort of risk can be mitigated. Mm -hmm. right, so, yeah, so it sounds like there's not much difference. It's just the timing uh, uh, of it, perhaps, and that, that people may have to get used to. So things happening a little earlier than uh, what uh, workers or nurses might be used to. But basically, yeah, not that, not that, not that uh, difference. Um, I want to move on now to, uh, I guess, getting away from uh, talking about the medical side of things, and uh, and uh, and we've been talking about the treatments recently, and 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 complex, I guess, uh, as not complex necessarily, but situation with. Uh, 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 the the medical issues that Jimmy might have, but there's also another really important issue there, uh, and that's uh, connection uh, and and Jimmy's social life. Uh, that's important as well. And he's always had a, a pretty good uh, social life um, in the past. Uh, so how important is, for example, Jimmy connecting with other people uh, with HIV? Um, uh, you know, having being able to talk to and, and socialise with or be with other people with HIV. So, Jeffrey, uh, what do you think in terms of uh, uh, peer connection or HIV uh, peer connection? How, how important do you think that is? Uh, for example, say a person with HIV, a peer worker or educator visiting you in a in an aged care facility. How 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 would difference would that make? Uh, in your life? I think it's about acceptance and the right sort of support from the caregiver and, of course, the client's behaviour to the carer is really important as well. So at the end of the day, it's about acceptance where you're at in life and making sure that you want to keep that quality of life that you have 
and improve it if, if necessary, if, if able to by the implication of um, application of the right sort of care changes as you move on down the track. And that is really important that your needs are, are met and reassessed as you go instead of, oh, he's been right for 10 years, well, he's all right, we, we won't worry about him, he's got everything I'm going fine. And um, come in and um, everything's going fine at the end of the day. Um, so it's really important that that type of care is given because it's 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 life giving. It's it it, it mm. makes people's life more, more worth living, and they they tend to improve the value of life, quality of life. It's really important. So uh, I guess that's part of a holistic care. So it's not just the looking after the medical side of things, but uh, the social side of things, uh, the emotional. Uh, side of things and and giving a holistic care uh, yeah. uh, really adds to to eventual quality of life as you yeah. age because uh, it's all at the end of the day it's all about quality of life and and that's part of that um and it's interesting uh, uh, there's a project called taking charge at uh, living positive victoria uh, and it's for people of uh, with age of 50 uh, aged 50 plus and uh, it seems quite interesting Melissa do you know about this project uh, taking charge and uh, and what is it exactly yeah um so taking charge is a project between living positive Victoria and Thorn Harbour health um, that run regular discussions and activities around various topics such as stigma and homophobia relationships general sexual health um, but allows for a safe space for discussion and sharing stories amongst peers. Um, a part of this project is also the Positive Self-Management pro Program that I mentioned briefly earlier, which runs um, two and a half hour sessions over six weeks. And the importance of this is to integrate, um, so they talk about topics such as integrating medication regimes and dealing with fr frustrations and fears. Um, as well as exercise and nutrition. It's targeted at um, over 40s. Um, and it, it, the aim is to get everyone to live well with HIV and improve their quality of life. And these are really important initiatives considering um, that so many older Australians and particularly those with HIV in our community suffer from social isolation, which has ongoing effects to uh, mental illness. All right, that sounds uh, very interesting, um, uh, particularly a self-management program that uh, uh, I guess that's about uh, the more the people know how to look after themselves uh, in terms of impact and, and, and eventual quality of life, uh, that sounds really important. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. Sorry, yeah. go on. Oh, it's just, a, again, about improving that health literacy and getting people to manage their own health, um, yeah, and improving their own quality of life. And that seems to be a theme that the, the federal government, in terms of funding uh, uh, age, the aged care sector, uh, that's what seems that they want more, more than ever before. They want people to, to be able to look after themselves at home more and more these days, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the shift has definitely been to community care rather than um, res residential aged care, um, you know, and with the push... Do you want me to continue? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, with the push to uh, My Age Care and getting services in for people, you know, I think a lot of people are scared to ask for help um, and can be seen as a weakness for some, um, like mm. they're admitting a, a fault. Um, you know, aged, aged, the word aged care has such a stigma attached to it, I think. For yeah. many, aged care is seen as, you know, ad admitting, you know, being admitted into a aged care facility full time and, and giving up all their rights and their independence, um, which isn't true these days. Um, and what I have realised over the years, though, are those that ask for help and accept services are those who are able to stay at home longer and remain independent, like Jeffrey. Um, others, and I was, yeah, I was going to ask you about impact. Do you do you see a positive impact on those who do uh, more of the caring for themselves and learning how to 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 look after themselves with the assistance of community? But but those yeah. the difference between those and those who go quite readily into a, a, a an aged care facility. 
Look, some people can thrive in a residential aged care facility and, and they're very, um, you know, social people and so they love that environment and they do thrive and for other people they prefer to stay at home in their own homes with their independence um, and with great services around them and it's about getting um, the services that fits that person you know aged care services or in-home aged care services are, are so wide and varied these days and it's really about giving back people quality of life you know, the people who struggle at home alone are the ones who, you know, they don't ask for help and then a crisis will occur, they'll be admitted to hospital. And sometimes at that stage, it's too late. Um, you know, they might have a fall, they might break their hip. Um, so it is better to get help and advice earlier. Um, but yeah, so aged care or community aged care in particular is about giving back the independence and the control to the person. It's very much person-centred. Um, it's about linking them in with services to make their life easier and, like I said, increase their quality of life. So just for instance, a referral to my aged care can allow for, you know, in-home nursing care to be started and, and suddenly they feel that their health is better controlled because they're taking their medication on time and appropriately. They might have a home medication review, be able to cut back on tablets. Um, if they have issues with continence, for example, or diabetes or pain, they can get a nurse to come do an assessment, provide education and support and manage their conditions more effectively. They can help them access funds like CAPS funding to pay for, you know, pads or um, the NDIS scheme for diabetes um, to, to access um, essential needs for diabetes. They might have a home OT assessment and get, you know, useful devices or modifications um, to help them live comfortably at home and increase their independence, their mobility, um, their strength, minimise instances of falls. They could be referred to transport or social assistance and, you know, suddenly they have someone to help them shop, take them out for a coffee and they're feeling less socially isolated. You know, all these things improve um, an individual's quality of life and do help them live longer. Yeah, yeah that, that sounds good. And, and, uh, I guess at the end of the day, it's all about uh, client-centred, looking at what mm. the client needs. It's about options. It seems mm. to be that uh, everyone's different, so the more options, uh, the range of options uh, is better, and uh, and supports a, a range of, uh, of supports uh, for people. Thanks uh, very just much for that. Example. So, just an example, Vicky, before you go on, um, with M what Melissa's saying about uh, it's important with home care and uh, your care and the quality of care you get is, is about relationship you build up in the, in the community as you move forward. Like I've been, had this one care for 22 years and she does all my care except for two hours a week. I've had great quality of care, good, um, developed a, a really good relationship with that lady that she, so far we're just good friends now, but she still does an amazing job and she's been doing it for 20 that quality of care i've got from her has enabled me to go back into the community and work tirelessly with the as a volunteer put my my good skills back into the community to save me going crazy i give back and it's amazing and i get that from her doing my care that's how important my care and the relationship with her through that aged care package and all that sort of stuff taking care of me has given me a greater quality of life and and continues to do so. That, that, that's, so that's thanks important. for sharing that, uh, Jeffrey, because it is it's about uh, care and compassion uh, mm. for what one does uh, in their work. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'd like to wrap it up there. Just uh, thinking about Jimmy now, and you know, it's been a few months since Jimmy's in uh, been staying at Green Acres. Uh, after a really anxious time of negative uh, experiences that left him quite concerned, things have, have sorted themselves out eventually. Mm. And he's uh, feeling much more uh, confident and, and accepted in the uh, in the facility now, as it should be, as we can all uh, uh, imagine that's why it should be. And from the perspective of the uh, facilities a agency's management, uh, from what uh, was thought to be potentially a really challenging issue, uh, with a bit of care and compassion, education, training, 
the residential facility has actually come to be something of a model that other residential facilities have begun to respect and, and are seeking to emulate, actually. Uh, and naturally, Jane, the manager, she's quite happy about that too. So at, at the end of the day, uh, all is well. Thank you very much. There's not a lot here, but thanks for that, Vic. That was great insight to the many challenges of someone living with HIV, moving into residential care. Um, I was, uh, we haven't got many questions here, so it must have been well presented, but um, just for, for Jen has sent a question in, um, probably ongoing from what you said, talking about earlier, Kate, and um, one question concerned that they recently heard about HIV and aged care setting was how the service would manage or with, and what their duty of care would be in the event that the positive resident entered into a consenting sexual relationship with another resident. So we talked about visitors, etc. before. This mm. is going into a relationship with another resident. The first Thanks, thing Kate. that the first thing that jumps into my mind is um, the word consenting. So we have two people who have consented. The second thing that comes into my mind is um, if we go back to the charter and what I said earlier, it does not make any delineation on any aspect of anybody. You are simply a person who is accessing residential aged care in this instance. What we'd need to look at is if two people consent, let's have a look. If there's an issue with that, what is the issue around that and for whom? That's what we need to be looking at. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I will, ju I will just um, elaborate just a little because sometimes uh, we will have a situation where there is a concern around someone's cognition and their capacity. And this is something that um, all of us, I think, who work in, in this field um, do find difficult because there are levels of capacity. And again, if we go back to consenting, we would need to, um, capacity is always assumed, always, until it is proven that, that, that it is not. And often you will, um, I was thinking a little bit about what David was saying earlier about comorbidities. I'm not a clinician, David, so please help me out here. But often um, people will uh, contact me, for example, and say, but this person shouldn't be doing that because they have a dementia and they're at risk. And that is one that I come across quite a lot. And for me, particularly when I'm doing information sessions, I will always frame it in the context of um, kidney disease is not kidney failure. It's a spectrum, if you like. It's, it, and so dementia is not this all-encompassing thing. Um, and so sometimes we'll say, well, I'm concerned about capacity or this person has a power of attorney uh, because they don't have capacity. And we, and again, not as a clinician, but the question that I would be asking um, the aged care service, if that's what the person who's contacting me wants me to do, because at our organisation, nothing happens without your consent. If they want me to do that kind of advocacy work, the question that I would be asking is, what is the capacity level here? because we don't want to confuse capacity and consent. Am I making myself clear here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, in answer to the question, the way it was put to me initially, Jerry, the, the golden word for me was consent. What, what other people may feel about that? And again, if we go back to um, what I was saying earlier, you know, um, mis misunderstandings, assumptions um, can be made. And the great work that all my colleagues in this seminar do around informing, look at what Marcus has described to us earlier on, where it can be demystified. These assumptions can be broken down. You know, David's information on the clinical stuff, what Melissa does, all this stuff works towards those, that stuff just going, those assumptions just being removed and, mm -hmm. and misunderstandings. I hope I haven't um, gone on too much. Thank you. I think it's also important, um, Kate, to know, uh, you know, obviously I totally agree with everything you've said, um, but your know, capacity is also not absolute in that, you know, you, yes. you may not, you may lack capacity for some things, but you're still yeah. able to make decisions about other things. Yeah. Um, and so that that's a little bit nuanced and would, mm. you know, need in this situation, um, potentially a, a 
you know direct assessment of that person's you know understanding and all that sort of all that sort of stuff yeah and david when when that is put to me it's put to me uh, quite often um when a case is brought to me um it'll be either the person themselves has contacted our organization or someone is contacting on their behalf and that word uh capacity will be used quite often and it's exactly as you say I, what do we mean by that? As you say, nuanced and, and capacity, you might have capacity to decide who you want to see, but you don't have capacity to manage your, uh, administer your finances anymore. There's layers to it. And so it's a word that always makes me go eek when it happens, uh, because I know there's going to be a lot of work that's going to go into that. And we would all know that as aged care service workers. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kay. Thanks. David? One question for Marcus. Um, over the years, you have dealt with many um, situations where we've spoken about with uh, Jimmy in in uh, real life. You've actually been through that uh, relationship with the people over years and years. Uh, how would you describe the general quality of people's lives after they've gone from you into a um, nursing home effect and then being looked after as as well as they can be as far as their capacity goes. How how do you see all that? Um, thanks for the question, Jeff. I, I think they've all done really well, but we don't quite let them get away that easily. We've got, um, we've got volunteers, part of my co-workers Rainbow Connection Program yep. that goes yep. in and sees clients in nursing homes and yep. takes them out for a coffee or some of them want to sit down and read the paper with someone or yep. do a movie. Um, David also brings a lot of people from all walks of life to the center to have some social connections. He had a 60 group here on Saturday last week. Um, I push my way into nursing homes because I'm not ready to let go of my clients either. So I go in and do coffee and cake with them or, or lunch, depending on what's happening. So I think, look, from what I see, uh, our clients who go in on different levels, uh, from someone who just goes in because they're getting older, they're concerned about where to now, or for clients who are really high maintenance with their health, with lots and lots of health issues, they are all treated with the greatest respect. And, you know, I've, I've just got to take my hat off to all those people working there. I would say that, you know, if um, if it were me coming to that point at 75, I'd certainly look to aged care and one of the venues that some of the clients of, of ours are in at the moment. They're well looked after. I, I can assure folks here that it's it's a good outcome for them. But it all starts with the conversations at the start, where people are at, what are they looking for, where do they want to be, how much do they want the place to know? Because a lot of our clients don't want the nursing home to know that they're gay. They're happy about their medical stuff being aired because obviously that is really, really important and the nursing staff need to know about all of that and how to address it. But yeah, yeah they're all they, they're all living really good lives, I've got to say. Vic, how um, important would you say for Living Positive Victoria that um, the peer support program is in relation to all people living with HIV around, you know, the the merger of heterosexual um, uh, acceptance in the gay community and vice versa, how that works with, with uh, the job that the peer navigators do in that area. Uh, I think it's really important. And I guess if we're talking about uh, integration uh, of of who and how and 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 cohorts uh, integration is really important so it's all about uh, everyone uh, working together uh, and supporting all people with HIV our, our yeah our mission or our charter is all is all about all people with HIV we we yeah. don't uh, 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 specify with gender or, or sexuality so uh, it's important that as an organization that we we support all people with HIV and then we, and we also support uh, or other organizations or agencies or anyone 
one working with uh, specific uh, cohorts uh, with HIV. And in terms of the peer navigators, you know, they, certainly they will work with anyone uh, yeah. who has HIV. Uh, uh, they might specialise uh, according to their knowledge and skills, uh, whether it be people from different cultural backgrounds or we have a peer nav navigator that may focus on women. Uh, uh, but yeah. at the end of the day, uh, they um, they certainly work with all all people with HIV, uh, and, and so it's about integration. It's about yeah. uh, I guess synchronization. It's, a, it's a, the more we work together uh, and sync uh, together, the better quality of service we can give. And at the end of the day, it's about quality of life uh, yeah. for everyone. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What level of support is available for? Um, aged care service providers, whether it's in the home or in resi care, if they have a resident or a client, I think they're called, um, with HIV, can they pick up the phone and say, hey, can we have a chat about this? Is um, that I'll support available? Yeah, Marcus. Um, I'll answer from Thorn Harbour. Oh, answer is yes. They, they can self-refer. They can get an agency like yourself or someone else who sees clients a lot, who thinks that, you know, um, <clears throat> Joe Blow in the community is not traveling too well and they need help. We have a program which is called Home Care. And in our Home Care program, it's based around home maintenance, but it's also a very social component to it. So a worker would go and do either a two or a three hour shift. It could be once a week, it could be, twice a week in some high maintenance areas, or it could be once a fortnight, just a worker goes in, sees how the client's going, works on, you know, projects or targets that the client wants to work with. So it's all about not us directing what the client should do. It's a client saying, I'm a bit of a hoarder and, you know, I need to get this place cleaned up. And, you know, my suggestion would be, how about you start with this little section and then as you, you know, build your confidence, because. You know, it's hard to give away and throw away stuff. Work, yeah. work to that. So we work with the client on achieving what they want to achieve as their goals. So we, we have that home care program, as I said, and we also have um, David's program, which is the Rainbow Connection. So a lot of people have come through that as well, through various councils actually on that one. So, yeah. And it's no uh, cost. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Um, the, it's important. Okay. Uh, to, to support Marcus, uh, uh, we you know, living positive Victoria and, and Thorn Arbor both work closely together, and, and I guess we're uh, compatible, if that's the right word, in terms of what we provide. We don't necessarily provide direct services that Thorn Harbour Health might provide, but we represent and advocate uh, on behalf of people with HIV uh, and can provide peer support as well. We also have a, a speakers bureau. Uh, uh, which uh, basically is a team of people with HIV that can go out to any organisation anywhere uh, uh, with uh, people who have lived experience with HIV to talk about their, their lived experience. And this is about building capacity uh, in the environment where people with HIV may be. So if it's an aged care facility, uh, a person from the Speakers Bureau can talk to the workers of that uh, aged care facility. Uh, and, and so this is about building capacity in, in the workforce and, and people who are supporting people with HIV. Uh, and, and so that's equally important too. It's a, you know, as Mark is saying, it's about supporting people with HIV and it's also about supporting uh, those who are supporting people with uh, HIV in, in whatever capacity it may be. Um, so sort of getting back to that holistic approach. Of, uh, of supporting people with HIV. Positive Living Centre too. So we're part of Thorn Harbour too um, and work closely with community support, but this is a drop-in centre, so we're always available too, um, you know, four days a week, 10 to four, whether it be for a, to speak to a client care support worker or a peer, and that's, uh, or to just drop in that psychosocial model of a community centre is here too, just to point out. And the David Williams Fund is very um, uh, supportive of people living with HIV AIDS in the community, and they support you through things like um, 
difficult times with food vouchers and sometimes when you can't afford to buy something you need for your house, which is imperative for your wellness or duty or um, you know just just quality of life, they if they can help you out through the David Rooney's fund and they do a marvelous job. They have done a marvelous job for. 30 or something years and they still continue to do that job in the community and um that also includes financial counseling so as jeffrey just mentioned so that's emergency relief basically for those in need but also um financial counseling is an option there too that's yeah. available service within this within the uh sector thanks for that um there's no other questions popped up here in this Kate. Hi again, it's me, Kate. Just wanted to um, reiterate a couple of things that I said earlier, um, that my organisation, Elder Rights Advocacy, is free, it's confidential and it's independent. And the thing that I do want to uh, say too is that um, I think sometimes the service that we provide is, is best encompassed for you all as a description of what it is by a uh, client who contacted us for support who said to me, uh, please don't take this the wrong way, but I hope I never see you again. And I think that's very indicative of what it means because people don't contact us to say, I'm having a great time. Just want to let share with that with you. I'm, you know, listening to Marcus and Melissa and, and Vic and Jerry, I'm thinking, gosh, that just sounds really great. But what, what, um, um, reality is that things do go wrong sometimes mm. with the care that people receive and people can contact us and of course wherever we can we will all work together thanks everyone thank you yeah well if there are no more questions then perhaps it's time to wrap up so um i want to say thank you to everyone here today to jerry arty vic um for organizing this and our panelists marcus uh, Kate, Melissa, David and Jeffrey for your time today and thank you everyone who attended live or who is watching the recording and if you have any further questions or comments feel free to reach out to Vic and we'll place his email address in the chat as well. Okay that's it thanks everyone and uh, go thank well. You.